debated. It just needs to be agreed upon. And a lot of doctrines are um, doctrines that are put forth in the Lutheran Church have to do with things like the sacraments, um, the nature of Christ, and who Christ is. In the Lutheran Church, um, social statements are not doctrines. But many people say that when the Bible teaches something, say, on sexuality, that that's a doctrine. It's not a doctrine. And so when I hear people saying we're not doing enough to combat false doctrines, I often hear them implying that we're not doing enough to counteract social or society norms or things that counteract um, or that contradict what they consider the Bible to be saying. That's a danger that I see. Um, so to me, the biggest danger, the biggest false doctrine, and I think I preach on this pretty regularly, is the prosperity gospel, which says Christ's death and resurrection is meaningless. God wants you to have everything. He wants you to have it abundantly. Just trust Him, work harder, do more, and it's all going to be yours. There's no gospel message in that to me at all. So that contradicts to me the basic nature of who Christ is and why Christ comes. The carrying out of how do we live as Christians, that I have a harder, harder time describing this doctrine. Um, the other issue is that false doctrine in the church, to me, applies more to leadership positions in the church versus every member agreeing with it. Um, so, I guess it's my way of, of viewing evangelism. I cannot, to tell you my belief about Christ and what that means to you as a proclamation, without listening to you and understanding your story and allowing uh, Christ to enter into your story and become part of your life, um, it may mean that your first understanding of Christ isn't quite kosher, for lack of a better word. But that, to me, also doesn't mean that through your questioning and through our discussions that I can't bring you along instead of kind of force-feeding the correctness. That's one of the problems I have. I think a lot of evangelism is I want to give you the, the true answers that we in the church have come up with for you. And we're kind of denying the work of the Holy Spirit to bring them along. So I guess personally I'm more open to differences in a lot of issues and understandings. But in terms of the basic doctrine of the faith and the confessions of the church, that I don't, to me that's pretty sad. But most of, most of the time when I hear false doctrine, it's like we need everybody to agree on this issue. And that's where I have a problem. And if we are agree on every issue, I guess I would question whether we're the church. Then I would think we're a cult. <laughs> Cults require total agreement, no differences, everything just so. And that's when you're not allowed questions. And so growing up, I wasn't supposed to ask certain questions. I was just supposed to believe it in my faith. So I learned not to question. And when I finally got permission to ask questions, I've never been able to go back. Mm -hmm. So, but that's a, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's, a, that's an accusation that I personally get quite a bit. Why don't I stand up and take firmer stances and say this is right and this is wrong and you've got to do it a certain way? And I just have a hard time with that. Yes? I think another way that, though, that you do prepare us to face the world and the challenges in the world is you keep reminding us that Jesus Christ's death and resurrection is the core of our belief and where we should focus. And to not get sidetracked from that very central, when you were talking about Paul particularly, not to get sidetracked from that main core of our belief, 
Jesus died, was resurrected, conquers evil. So I think that's another way you do that. Maybe it's maybe it's not. Well, yeah. It's, for me, how salvation comes by the grace of God through the death and resurrection of Christ, which I accept through faith, and that then should influence my life and how I live and the hope that I have. Um, therefore, I don't believe that my stance on a social issue determines my salvation. Now, there are those who would disagree and say your stance on the social issue describes your faith. Therefore, you really don't have faith if you don't have the right stance on an issue. I disagree with that. Um, but people do have that opinion. I'm okay with that opinion. <laughs> They're just not okay with mine. <laughs> I can live with them, they can't live with me. <laughs> they want to change me. Okay. So is my wife. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. um, a friend whose son was not getting all the answers he wanted to as he got into later teens and early 20s, had a relative in Jehovah's Witnesses. He was able to get his answers. Yeah. And the way, you know, not a, maybe, 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 but it was, this is right. the answer. Right. Yeah. So that's the direction he went. Right. Yep. And, uh, you know, anxiety loves certainty. And the more anxious that we are, the more desire we have for an answer. And so I want it to be solved. And if I can solve it, and I'm rigid. And that's why, you know, in the 90s, the more conservative, literal congregations grew the fastest. And that was thought to be the model. From now on, you have to begin to be right down this line. That's fallen apart. And so it worked for a while, but it came to an end. Those are no longer. Now the biggest, fastest churches are the prosperity gospel churches. They're not into rigidity and legalism and all that stuff. That was the highlight of the moral majority and all that stuff. Now it's, God loves you. He wants you to be happy. Just send more money into me and make me happy. <laughs> Buy my book and you'll get the secret. <laughs> and that to me is, that's what I battle the most. Because it just eliminates Christ. We've taken crosses out of churches. We, you know, I've got, you know, a friend who watches Joel Steen all the time. I said, please, tell me how many times he says Jesus. He finally came back to me one week and he said, he mentioned Jesus this week. <laughs> he was so surprised. I go, wow, that's awesome. He got around the time. How did you do well, he, he told one of the stories that Jesus told like, about how to. Okay. <laughs> I just have a huge issue with that. But it's popular. It's what people want to hear. And he calls it good news. There's so much bad news in the world. This is good news. God just wants to give everything to me. And there's an element of truth to that. I can't say it's all wrong, because there is some truth to that. But boy, you've basically taken away the gospel message of death and resurrection. That you know, we have God has committed Himself to us and given Jesus and all that Jesus is, so that we will commit all of ourselves to Him. And the prosperity gospel, as I hear it, is, yeah, God wants you to do better, but He wants to shower all this stuff upon you. There's really no responsibility on your part other than just to receive it or, you know, hang in there. And there's nothing wrong with hanging in there. That's good, too. But, yeah, that to me is a more of a doctrinal issue, Margaret. I've heard rumors that some churches are not celebrating Good Friday. Yeah. Well, Saddleback, I believe, last year started Easter services on Friday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we went one year because we had something that evening, and we went to the and it, we thought it was a dry service, we didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we went, and I said, oh, Nick, they're going to give us a free lunch after a paper bag lunch, because you can come on their lunch hour. It was an Easter service. I thought, this is so bizarre. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. How yeah, it's so. Risen? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> they have 35,000 members, and they can't get them all there unless they have three or four services. Yeah. But you know, we celebrate six weeks of Easter following Easter. 
but we still have time for Friday. Do they move Friday up to Thursday? No. no. They ignore it because they that's know. bad news. That's depressing. It brings people down. They don't acknowledge Lent. And Lent, I don't care if they don't acknowledge that. But to celebrate Easter without the knowledge or the experience of Good Friday is kind of hollow. That's why Palm Sunday got changed, because we realized people go from the celebration on Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus as King, to Easter, and they skip Thursday and Friday. And so we've tried to move Good Friday to the Sunday before so that we can at least get the message out and we don't pass over it for the majority of folks who don't come. So that's why it's now called Passion Sunday and not Palm Sunday. So we celebrate as Palm slash Passion Sunday. Celebrate both. But uh, 